So welcome to one more iteration of our Montreal MLOP guest lecture series. Uh, today, I have the great pleasure of hosting and welcoming uh, our distinguished colleagues, colleague Anastasios Kirilidis, or Tassos. Uh, he also happens to be a good friend of mine from uh, more than 30 years ago now. So this is the little background here. Uh, with you know, I know him. He's my neighbor. He was my classmate in elementary school, and I've always uh, followed his work. And we've had parallel paths um, from Greece to Texas, all over the place. Uh, so right now he is an assistant professor in at the university at Rice University in Houston uh, at the CS department, also affiliated with the uh, electrical engineering department. Uh, Tasso, uh, welcome. We're excited to hear about what you have to say about distributed learning uh, of neural networks and uh, the properties that you rely to do this. So the floor is yours. Everyone, your questions in the chat. Let's do this. Thank you, Gianni. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I start saying, uh, like, uh, telling you guys stories with uh, what we have been going through with Yanis, like, uh, since I think that uh, more or less six years old or even a little bit younger, uh, like uh, really by neighbors, he means like really he could see my house from his room, uh, like his, his own apartment. Uh, and yeah, I mean, same elementary school uh, and actually, yeah, also high school, same undergraduates uh, school. At some point I said, that's enough. You should go to Texas, I will go to EPFL uh but then i said that okay that was not a very good uh, idea so i tried to follow him at texas but then he left and he went to to stanford and yeah since then i'm changing him i'm not sure whether i'm going to end up to montreal i will see we'll see uh yeah, we'll so see anyway because, uh, love story yeah yeah exactly exactly um uh, anyway so thank you very much for the invitation Yanni. uh i mean i'm, I'm honored to give like a talk to this uh, to this group i have followed uh, at least like the, the speakers that you have. Uh, what, I ha what I have to say about this talk is that it's less theoretical, but I think that at least from my perspective, it raises some nice questions as open questions. Uh, so this is a joint work with several students and um, uh, uh, like professors. It's like a joint work with mostly Chris Germain uh, here at Rice CS, which actually his expertise is, is in databases and large scale systems. Uh, also recently with Santiago Segarra, who is actually an expert in, in graphs and graph convolution neural networks. And several students, Binghang, Chen, Cameron, Yu Ching, and, and Jake. Um, and um, today's talk is exactly on distributed learning of neural networks using independent subnet training. This is uh, uh, funded by a joint grant from NSL and Intel. So they are interested in this kind of like uh, idea. So we're actually excited about this. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time introducing myself. As I said, like uh, the only thing that I want to you to remember from this slide is like I have both EE and CS background, which means that I really like things um, like algorithms to be practical. So it's not just only big O notation. I would like also to have something that works well in practice. Uh, optimization for machine learning, algorithmic theory, some research keywords just to say what, what kind of things I'm working on currently. It's not like this is not the audience actually to introduce uh, myself in that depth. So I will directly go to um, what is today's talk. So what is the motivation? Um, I will give you two scenarios because the, the algorithm that I'm going to describe apply in both of these cases. One scenario is most probably most of you are uh, familiar with. You have a neural network. You have your implementation in TensorFlow or PyTorch. You would like to make it uh, faster and you're willing to pay more in AWS, for example, in any other like company, and you would like to say, if I pay twice more, it should be twice as fast. Uh, but this is not the case at all. Like um, uh, most of the protocols that we have for distributed learning, they are not even like accelerating at all. Maybe they give you the, the option to handle bigger cases, but you don't see necessarily this speed up. Um, and the other case I want to highlight, which is more like related to federated learning, you have mobile machine learning applications, uh, but because you have um, like uh, heterogeneous, like let's say uh, um, uh, compute size, you might have 
uh, uh, let's say, mobile phones to come in and out in an arbitrary way in a, in a system. Uh, you might have energy restrictions. So you have many things to worry about so that your distributed protocol is actually efficient. You cannot just rely that I'm going to send the whole model out there repeatedly in all the, uh, the client nodes uh, and then wait forever and then again wait for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, I'm not going to get into the federated learning because there is there, there is the issue of non-ID data, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you, you will understand what what the like the gist of this of this talk is. Um, as Jan said, uh, uh, feel free to jump in if you want to get to to ask questions. I would like this to be more like interactive. So if you don't understand something, just let me know. Uh, and I will try actually to uh, go a little bit fast at the very beginning so that I don't repeat myself. Uh, for things that you guys know, but I would like also to set up the background. So in case that for those of you who are not going to be here for the whole talk, um, the idea is about having a neural network and having a, a, a different way of training a neural network in a, in a distributed way. So we call it independent subnet training. So the idea is that you have the neural network, you split the network in a specific way and you share only the subnetwork to each of the device. Okay, each of the device trains the local model for some number of iterations, local SD iterations. You don't, this, you don't do this forever. It's not ensemble training. I want to highlight this, but before you, after you finish some local SD iterations, you share your updates to the full, to the parameter server. Okay, so you, you, you re-ensemble the full network. Okay, and then you start a new iteration. Where the new iteration is that you're going to create new subnetworks which are actually randomly um, uh, created. It's not that I have the same subnetworks again and again because otherwise it's just ensemble training. Okay. So the key attributes here, and I'm going to um, stress it, uh, like I'm going to highlight this later on, is that this way you send fewer parameters over the distributed network. So you don't have to send the same full model on each of the client. Okay. Each of the client updates less number of parameters which means that a smartphone will spend less energy instead of training a big, I don't know, ResNet 101 kind of like network. Um, you allow local updates, which is not like uh, our only, um, not only our attribute, let's say, because local SCD applies also for the data parallel case, but it just happens that you're definitely faster and it might be the case that in some cases we have observed that you might get better final accuracies. So even it seems that you're approximating the data parallel, it seems that there might be some time of regularization happening like um, in the background. Okay, so the current status, let's say, is that uh, just to give you like what we have been working on is like we want to make this kind of idea work on different neural network architectures. Um, we want to provide as much theory as we, uh, as we can and as much close to what we actually do in practice. Okay. And we want to study frameworking. I mean, this is cut off. Like we want to study in, in different scenarios, whether you can on top of that have quantization, whether you want, uh, you want to apply this in federated learning kind of scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of like the, the main, the theme of this, um, of this talk, okay? So if you're happy with whatever I said so far, you can leave, no problem at all, but it's, it's something that I want to highlight that these are the, the main things that you have to remember from, uh, from this talk, okay? So background of distributed learning, just to be, uh, to have you uh, all on the same page, we have that mostly the two distributed protocols is the data parallel and the model parallel. The data parallel, and if we assume that we want to minimize a function f, we assume the empirical risk minimization finite sum scenario where here, of course, it is full gradient descent, but of course, you're going to do stochastic gradient descent you actually compute the gradients on each of your sample and actually you do this um, this iteration in gradient descent so in the data parallel sense and this is a picture from dimitris uh, uh talks is as, as follows the simplest case is that you have a node the compute node that works as a parameter node you have a bunch of workers and what you would like to do is actually to distribute this computation over the, 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 the whole network so that not only one worker or only one node actually does the dedication. So the idea is that you have the model, XT is your model. This is what you share over the distributed setting, okay? So you share the current model to each of the worker. You wait for each of the worker to compute each part of the full gradient or mini batch gradient, okay? Then each of them sends back their, um, uh, their updates to the parameter server 
and the parameter server actually waits for all in most cases. I'm not going to get into the discussion of stragglers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You wait most of them, uh, if not all of the updates, in order to create your gradient step and do the, the gradient step um, to have the new iterate. Okay. The, what I would like to highlight here, and then I maybe I will pause for some questions if there are any, is just to give you an example of what is the amount of communication that it might be involved in this kind of a scenario. Okay, so assume that the input to your neural network, so your model X is actually a neural network, is 100,000 dimension. You can easily create a scenario like this. Okay, so the pixels of images or something like that. The architecture is going to be very simple. It's just a feed-forward neural network with two hidden layers. Its, its layer is actually 4,000 neurons, more or less. Okay. So assume that you have a system of some number of devices. Assume that you have a specific bat size. It turns out that per communication, you need more than 100 gigabytes to, to share. Now, in the first case where maybe you have AWS G, GPUs, might not be a big deal, but definitely it is a big deal if you have a wireless system, federated learning, and so on and so on. Okay. So you have to be very careful about how you're going to use and what kind of model, how many devices, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to figure out whether your system can handle this kind of like um, uh, of, of communication. OK, so um, that's one case. And again, I'm not saying that uh, data parallel is the most used scenario actually in distributed training. I'm not saying that it's not it's not used. Um, the other the other perspective is the model parallel where you actually see that uh, sharing the whole model over all the nodes is kind of like problematic, okay? Um, and in that case, you actually split the model according to how many clients you have. For example, here, if you have three layers of a feed-forward neural network, you have three machines, you say that machine number one takes the first layer, machine number two takes the, the second layer, and so on and so on. Um, but the problem here is kind of like communication, like each of the nodes, more, most of the time, of course, I know this can be pipelined, you have to wait the previous layer to send you all the information in order to also do the back propagation the same way. Okay, so it kind of alleviates the situation of how much information you serve from, from node to node. Okay, uh, but definitely uh, there is more synchronization um, uh, compared to the data parallel case. Okay, so its device propagates forward paths, uh, for forward parts of uh, um, uh, uh, of XT and its device back propagates uh, uh, this, this, this part. Okay, so I will stop here. I know that there are actually ways that you can actually, for example, in the data parallel case, there is no reason for you to have a centralized parameter node. You, you can have a distributed parameter node, which is actually much better than having like only one uh, to be the parameter server. Okay, uh, but of course, these are kind of like um, the two. Uh, most well-known protocols out there. Uh, I assume that I can wait for some questions on this point. That's all. And yeah. This might be a good opportunity for me to point out. You've partially answered the one question here on the chat by Alessandro. Uh, how do you deal with uh, you know failures in the nodes, parameter the parameter node, and the worker nodes, right? Um, so that was the the question that came up. So so how do you handle failures? I'm not going to discuss this. It's not that we have, um, um, as you will see, like the protocol that I'm going to describe uh, has more fundamental problems rather than right now worrying about the failures. That's a very good question later on, whether actually uh, the way that you distribute the, the information, if one of the um, uh, workers fails, what happens. But I can, I can conjecture that whatever I'm going to present will not have any problem with failures. You, ju you just let them fail and it's going to be fine. But for the data parallel case, which is not our work, or the model parallel, I assume there are like works. I assume that also Dimakis has kind of like a distributed coding kind of ideas in case you fail someone, or there is a work by Sami Benzio, which actually says that you can have an excessive number of workers and you don't wait for all of them, but a significant number of them, and you're going to be fine. Right, the idea of over-provisioning. Uh, more workers than you will need, and then there are those all those gossip algorithms, I guess. Yeah. Decentralized yeah. things even further. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so that's the background, just to let you know what um, um, what someone like data parallel is implemented already in PyTorch and, 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 and TensorFlow. So it's something that you can actually directly use. 
And because of the bottlenecks that we kind of like identified, at least for the applications we consider, we thought that is there another way to do like training? Okay, so uh, this is what we call independent subnet training. And at the beginning, later on, we actually have more neural network architectures. But just for simplicity, I'm going to start with a feed forward bottom up kind of like representation. You have inputs at the very bottom, you have three layers, you have the output at the, at the top. Okay, and this is your model. This is like what represents your X in the optimization problem. Okay, so this is what you have to share in the data parallel case in for to each of your clients. Um, and as I said, that even if you have only feed forward uh, uh, like layers with significant number of neurons, this is like an excessive uh, amount of information that you have to share. So what we actually thought, and I'm going to start directly with the idea, is the following: instead of Considering the model as it is, what I'm going to send to its client is actually, let's call it a sparsified version of that. Okay, so for each layer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subsample uh, um, the neurons. Okay, so uh, I only consider the neurons which is actually in black for client number one, which means that I reduce a lot what uh, the, the number of weights um, that are actually active and the number of weights that I have to share let's say, with client number one. Okay, you can see that this is a weak classifier compared to the strong classifier, if I want to call it the left-hand side of this slide. Okay, so this still can classify your problem if you had this model only, but it, it will not do the best job that you can actually do. Okay, so this is like the composition number one. Instead of stopping here, I'm going to say, okay, what is as a leftover of the number of the neurons that I haven't picked? I'm going to create another, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, weak classifier. So there is no overlap, at least for now, between the weights. So I, I select neurons which are not used in any other worker. Okay. Um, um, and this will change later on. This is not like necessary, but this is like for the purposes of this um, at this point of the talk. And in order just to complete all the neurons that are actually in the model, I'm going to create another one. So I have three clients here um, that actually take part of the weights of the full model and they try to locally train their smaller parts before they share their updates to them uh, uh, to the global model. Okay, so here the union of neurons make the original network, but the union of parameters do not make the original network necessarily. But because you have to repeat this many times and randomly you select the neurons with some probability definitely constant, you're going to, like after many epochs, many iterations, you're going to touch upon all the weights actually of the original model. Okay, so um, I will stop here whether there are any questions, but what I have actually described here is not an algorithm, it's just a decomposition of a neural network into smaller networks. And yeah, I, I, it's, I would like to take any questions if there are any at this point. Okay, so we'll see if there are any hands or uh, questions in the chat. Uh, for now, I guess you will probably tell us in the slides coming up, but I'm curious how many of these subnets are you going to consider? And uh, that, right? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That's kind of like one of the theoretical questions that we want to answer, whether there is like, um, like you cannot assume um, uh, a, a weaker classifier that actually has only one neuron on each of the layers, because it's going to be a direct path from the input to the output, and this is not a very good classifier. So somehow the size of the network and the number of GPUs or whatever CPUs you want to, to try, for the moment it's a, it's a heuristic. Usually we have big enough and wide enough neural networks that you can easily just naively split it according to the number of GPUs that you have. But if you are like uh, an institute that has like 1000 GPUs and you want to use all of them, we do. then you have to be careful how, you, how you're going to split. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and I, yeah. question? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just saw one question, but please go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, there are two uh, good uh, points and questions in the chat. One from Jing saying like, there's are, are there connections to drop out here is the first question. Yeah. yeah. The other question. And uh, Sergey is also pointing out that 
um, it seems that uh, training thin and deep networks is generally more challenging than training wide networks. So is there potentially an issue here of uh, you know, you're forcing your worker nodes to work on those Tinder networks. Does that cause some challenges? Yeah, yeah. So, so for the first question, I totally agree with that. We uh, we saw this connection. This is kind of like a distributed version of the dropout technique. Um, dropout in the original version, at least, is is what is actually per iteration of the SCD you create, you subsample, and then you have the smaller network and you keep doing that here, we just use this technique in order to share no less number of, let's say, parameters over the network. And the question here is that we do this in parallel and somehow we're going to take these, new, uh, these uh, models and we're going to reassemble them before we start again and we do uh, a next round of like uh, independent subnet training. Like the dropout is exactly, um, is, is very similar and we actually got this idea from dropout, but the original idea that we had is that how can I actually uh, reduce the number of communication and computation on for each client? And one way to do this is, is like that. Um, that for the next question is, yes, I agree with that. You will see also in the results that probably if you go deeper and thinner, you might lose some accuracy while at the same time, though, being much faster than the data parallel. So there's kind of a trade-off. That's why I said that there are some times we can actually get even better accuracies. In most cases, we meet the state of the art where at the same time, we reduce the communication time or anyway, the, the overall time, the execution time. And there are cases that actually I can tell you like uh, openly, like for example, if you consider ImageNet, it's very easy, very difficult to like get the state of the art result with this method. This is what we have been currently working on because we have like, a, let's say a 3% gap that we try to, to close and we cannot do it so far, but this is exactly ongoing work that we actually uh, do right now. Thank you. Uh, uh, the last question here by Mike, uh, which is related to the dropout question uh, regarding relay, potential relationships to ensembles or mixtures of experts. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I, we have actually, because I remember Mike, we discussed this like uh, in person through your discussions. We got, uh, I got into like being curious about ensemble training. I got curious about lottery ticket hypothesis. I got curious about uh, uh, like quantization. Uh, so all these things are related. And so far we have been kind of resilient. We have experiments where we say that we're actually were um, at least as good as ensemble methods without having, like, without um, storing many models in order to do the inference. We just have one model and still have like uh, the same performance as ensemble training. Um, and there are cases where actually we, we might get an even better because just to connect with the previous uh, question, if it is a dropout kind of like regularization, you might get some gains from nowhere. So there is something like in this technique that actually boosts a little bit your, your training uh, in terms of accuracy. Um, and yeah, I mean, later on, I'm going to talk about, uh, like, I, we have some results about quantization, which is like an or orthogonal thing, but on top of what we do, we can also do quantization and still preserve, let's say, the, the accuracy. And yeah, I hope that this answers the question uh, of Mike. Right on. Good. So this is kind of like how you decompose the neural network again on a simple case, which is fit forward neural networks. Later on, we're going to discuss about uh, convolution neural networks, ResNets, and graph neural networks, okay? So um, this is how we decompose the model, but it's not the algorithm. The algorithm is as follows, okay? You have the model, you have, for example, this simplistic case of like the parameter server client, client let's say, uh, setup, okay? So what we actually have described is like, you have the model in the parameter node. The parameter node is going to send the indices, the weights, and it's not exactly what we actually implement because there might be an overhead if you keep the model and the indices, et cetera, et cetera. We have an efficient implementation of that, okay? But you only have to send parts of the model to each of the worker. So each of the worker now has a smaller version of the, of the model, okay? You actually, just because, and it's not like, an, uh, like it's not necessary to be non-overlapping neurons, but you have completely independent 
we classify it on each of the workers that you apply some number of local SED updates. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, I want again to highlight we don't do this till the end of the execution. The main difference with ensemble methods is because you just run it for a small number of local SCDs and then you share your updates back to the parameter nodes to reassemble the full uh, model before in the next iteration you randomly create new subnetworks. They're not the same. So somehow, for example, in the next iteration, worker one might have neurons from all the workers. And you have to be very careful here because you, if you allow each of the worker to go long for many number of local SED iterations, you might have model drifts. They're, they're going to go into different directions. So somehow you have to be careful about how you set the local number, the number of local SED iterations. And at the same time, ideas like bus normalization or this kind of like normalization um, uh, techniques are very important because at the very beginning, we started with no bus normalization. And if you think about it, it's like if you think of a neuron that expects a specific distribution as an input from the previous iteration, if it goes to a different network, then it might be quite crazy for it to expect to work the same way. So you have to normalize things. Otherwise, things are going to really drift away. You're going to have major loss in, in, in terms of accuracy. So um, I'm hiding a lot of details here. Uh, it is both like conceptual and implementation wise. Really, we had even like we saw that uh, the current implementations of, of um, the NVIDIA SDK does not we would like to have more functionalities actually they do not allow or like we we would like to have more functionalities that they're easy to implement from the CUDA let's say uh, uh, distribution because right now we don't do we do things inefficiently just because GPUs they usually assume either data parallel or model parallels here we do something else um, and it's something that I would like to talk at some point if I get a chance to talk with someone who works in NVIDIA and finds this very interesting, that would be a case. But for the moment, we kind of like try to do as, as efficient as possible with, uh, with the current distribution. A quick question, so, Tasso. Yeah. Do, you, do you also run into trouble because in some sense you're sparsifying the networks and GPUs are, are not particularly amazing at, at sparse things? Uh, that's that's one. Let's say um, um, we don't we don't want to use and send over the network a big. Let's say uh, definitely like we don't send the masks which are mostly zeros and one where where we have like um, active neurons. Uh, it is exactly what you said that if you have sparse things, GPUs are not great. And at the same time, the way that they broadcast kind of like messages is not the most efficient one for us. Um, and really, like uh, students are trying to figure out whether we can actually do, uh, like, implement our own like version of like how to bro broadcast uh, messages, but we're not there yet. Um, yeah. Other questions? I, I think I saw another question. There's one more. Is the number of local iterations does it have to be the same among all worker nodes? Uh, no, that's one of the way to simulate also federated learning. We assume that each of the worker might be a different smartphone, let's say, with different capabilities. So we say that one takes only 20, the other takes, I don't know, 40. Uh, and still, it seems to be like doing OK. Of course, if you allow one of the worker to go into thousands where we have model drift, um, it's going to be difficult like to, it's going to harm you somehow. But yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Good question. OK, thank you. So this is just one iteration. And as I said, in the next iteration, you reassemble the full model and then you send random indices, new uh, subnetworks to each of the workers to do the next iteration. Okay. So I will start with some practical, let's say, results just to motivate you guys. Then I will go into some theory where you can imagine that this is like, I believe that it is not like a trivial task. And I will just highlight where are the difficulties. And I can give you some results, but for me, it is just proof of concept. And it's not like a, a task of proving good convergence rates or convergence rates, uh, rate regions. Okay. So, um, convergence regions. So, in practice, uh, assume for the moment that we mostly talk about the feed forward neural network. 
Okay, so the only thing that we distribute over the network is not any convolutional layers, it's only that you have some fully connected layers and this is what, how you split it according to what I said. So we have three set of experiments. Um, one is, let's say, the, the, the small one, um, and the reason we have a small one is just to uh, also use this in a CPU cluster. You have only just a two or three layer neural network, fit, fully connected with a number of, let's say, neurons per layer, okay? And we have like this setup of two, four, or eight, let's say, CPUs. Um, then we have the following scenarios. Forget about the CIFAR 100, to be honest. We tried the full ImageNet case. The full ImageNet case is when we have 21,000 clusters. This is uh, classes. This is the case where the number of neurons and weights that you have to send over the full, like over the, the data parallel, really blows up because the last matrix that you have is at least 21,000, let's say, in dimension. And you cannot just do like data parallel naively. So you have to be careful, okay? So the full image net includes like 14 um, million images. It has 21,000, let's say, categories. And this is where we use GPUs. Of course, you might see the weird number VGG12. Why not VGG16? It's all a matter of like what we could do with the amount of money we had and the amount of time that we had, okay? So, so really, as you will see later on, we, we try to do and have like more, let's say, um, uh, 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 let's say uh, baselines which, where people know. But you have to remember here that this is the full ImageNet case. It's not that I know many papers that they actually try the full ImageNet scenario. And as on a, another extreme classification problem, the Amazon data set where the, the last, let's say, uh, dimension is actually 670,000, 670 um, uh, K. Okay, um, so what are the results? This is like um, um, not a complete story, these this plots, but what I'm actually showing here is the speed up that you might get if you compare with one epoch of a single worker SCD. This does not answer the question, how many epochs do you need to get to the final accuracy? But it just says that per iteration, including both computations and communication, how much you are going to be faster than SCD. And given that you actually share less information and you actually um, uh, use a number of nodes and each node does not uh, update the full model, you expect to have some speed up. But what we would like to highlight here, of course, you can see that the data parallel in some cases does not provide much of a speed up. You have the local SCD scenario, which is the data parallel case that actually um, does some local SCD updates without synchronizing with the parameter set. Okay, so you have some speed ups, but of course what I want to highlight here, because this includes all the time, all the timings, like it's both the communication and computation time, you see that you can get very good speed up by using our method. But this is not the full story, because someone would say you might have, we might take many more iterations in order to converge. Okay, so in, that, in order to complete the story, this is the story where the per this, let's say, curve, which is on the left, more on the left of each of these plots, is our method, okay? Then you have the blue curve, which is the data parallel, and then you have, uh, if I see correctly, it's the orange, green, and red, which is the data parallel with local SCD, okay? These are numbers that we try to optimize. We don't cherry pick the results, to be honest. Um, and what we saw here is the y-axis, the test accuracy, the x-axis is the actual time that you take to get to some accuracies, okay? So what you can see is in most cases, if not in all cases, you see the, our curves being more on the left of each of these plots. We get to the same accuracy, even if we kind of like approximate our, like our, um, um, let's say you can see that our method is kind of an approximation of the data parallel. There are cases, if you focus on the first circle, that we get faster to a better accuracy. Of course, we didn't, let, we didn't have the time to let it like converge, but you can see that we actually get a better accuracy within the some amount of time. And there are cases where we kind of like be below the state of the art, but still we can get there faster, okay? So this might be, um, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say the first set of experiments before I move on, I see some uh, some uh, some questions already. Yeah, if you want to address them, uh, sure. I can um, 
as a question by Sergey. Have you compared with the all reduced learning as an alternative to the star architecture? Uh, I think that's what our, uh, yeah, I assume that every every node is actually connected with every other node. Is that the case? Uh, actually, okay, so he meant ring reduce. So uh, let's start by clarifying what is your current connectivity architecture that you're assuming? So every node is connected with every other node. We have a distributed implementation and every node is in responsible for part of the model. So if the communication is actually not the bottleneck that I was actually showing uh, in the in the just to motivate the, the scenario. I see. So part of the part of your point is here that uh, if you were to get a consider a better communication architecture, either all reduce or ring reduce, whatever makes most sense, um, you would be maybe improving the thing that's not slowing you down. And I guess computation yeah. is what's slowing you down. Um, in this particular case, I, I cannot say for sure whether computation or communication is slowing down, but what do you mean by slow, slowing down the data parallel kind of like part or our, our, our part? I guess, um, I guess the original problem, the, the original data parallel yeah. implementation. So, so we be my question. distributed implementation, like there is no parameter server only for only one node for the parameters for the data so it's the same exactly set up for all for uh, uh, all the algorithms that i'm showing here i see and then uh, okay so sergey's uh, clarification is what if you were to use a more efficient communication architecture for the data parallel uh, setting and then it's it's interesting to consider whether that would change your baseline so, so I, I would be very interested to know more what is a more efficient communication, to be honest. Yeah, so but, the, yeah, uh, we can, we can have this discussion maybe afterwards. Sure. But yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you, Sergey, for your question. So um, just to give you an idea in terms of numbers here, and I'm going to go walk you through this table. Uh, this is like instead of just uh, seeing the curves, just to see how going from a number of nodes that you use in your system. So anyway, we have four examples here. Okay, um, we have data parallel local SCD, which is data parallel allowing each of the client to spend some local number of SCD iterations. We have the, our method here. Uh, we have two, four node, two, four and eight node um, scenarios. Either it is CPU or GPU. Okay. We have some accuracies. These are not the final accuracies, by the way, but we just said that in order to get to a specific accuracy, how many seconds you get. And the numbers that you see is actual implementation in AWS with whatever we could do, with whatever functionality it was, it was given to us. Okay, so you can actually see that, for example, there are cases in the IST scenario where we can kind of like either preserve or lower or even do not allow it to grow in terms of number of uh, seconds. Um, there is also a local SED um, uh, version of that that actually does not allow the number of seconds to grow as you, num you increase the number of nodes. But you can see at least that if you take like the absolute numbers in order to get to the same accuracy, IST is much better than, than local SED. And we try to be really careful about all the number of hyperparameters that you're all the hyperparameters that we're going to use. So uh, if you fo focus, for example, in the case of the full ImageNet, the local SCD might take for eight nodes up to 39,000 seconds while we get 10,000 seconds. We don't get, um, uh, let's say, uh, necessarily X, let's say speed up, where X is like the number of nodes that you use. And that's a very good question whether the distributed scenarios is something that someone would like to use because there are cases where as you increase the number of nodes, you actually take more time to converge. And that's a standard thing that you see. Uh, but there are cases, and I'm going to show later on, that actually we, we manage to have an acceleration compared to a single node uh, distributed, to a single node, let's say, execution. Okay. This, this, is not, this is not a new, let's say, information compared to the uh, to the figures that I showed, but I just wanted to, to tell you how the methods scale as you increase the number of nodes in your, into your system. 
and you can see that especially for the large scale scenarios, the data parallel and the local SCD, they're not even close to whatever we can actually achieve for the ISD. The accuracy is very low because I cannot remind you that this is the full ImageNet, not the 1K ImageNet. So 26% is not like a very good accuracy. Uh, but for the full ImageNet, it, it, it's something. Okay. Now, just some final, let's say, results for this simplified scenario, scenario yet. This is still new, like fully connected neural networks. If someone would say, maybe you're faster, but you're not getting the um, a better final accuracy, at least for the cases that we consider here, it turns out that the IST, the final accuracy is better. So this is kind of like weird. So you can actually spend less time. I cannot like promise that it is like uh, significantly less time, but definitely if you let it run for more, uh, let's say um, seconds or more hours, if you want to say, you are going to get uh, a better final accuracy compared to the other method, like at least in these simplified scenarios that we consider, okay? So um, this is kind of like saying that maybe you lose in accuracy, but there are cases, and as I said, this is kind of like regularization. Maybe this distributed dropout kind of idea kind of like helps you also to get a boost in terms of the final accuracy. And the last thing I want to say is that this is kind of like one of the motivations that we had is that maybe in some scenarios, and this is the Amazon kind of like scenario, maybe you would like to increase the width of your models in order to get better accuracies. But if you increase the model, the width of the model, it means that it might not fit into your memory. So the classical data parallel thing will tell you, I fail to um, uh, keep this in my memory, while our method keeps improving the accuracy. And at the same time, because it splits the model as it does, maybe you can actually handle bigger models uh, uh, with this distributed setting. Okay. Uh, so so we, yeah. we have one more uh, short question by Mike in the chat, and it I think it was for the previous table, probably table three, and mm -hmm. and it was about whether you have the same number of a fixed number of iterations here. We have a fixed number of iterations for local SED, but I'm not sure I have the the results here because of this question. I remember this question by Mike. We actually have ablation study about how the local number of SED uh, affects with the number of workers and still we manage to use the best we can do with respect to the number of workers that we have. So if you have two workers, you have to use a different number of local SED. If you have eight workers, you have a different number of local SED that is the best. And we try to do, to do as, as, as best as we can in order to have a fair comparison. I'm not sure whether that was his question actually, whether it relates to that. He seems happy. Mike, Mike is the best source of questions, I think. Thank you, Mike. Uh, okay, Tasso, you can proceed. So, um, some theory. I'm not, this is going to be fast. We're not there yet. In the sense that uh, if, you, if we want to think about this problem, like you want to minimize this, let's say, uh, sum of functions, what we actually do if we want to think about it, if you have the model XT, you actually decompose this XT into a number of worker speed that you have. So it kind of like, subset of the elements in these xt vectors that I show, then you actually do some gradient descent steps, but this gradient descent is not the, this g function that I'm showing here is not the, neither the coordinate descent version of that or the stochastic version of that. This is a completely new function, if you think about this. Um, and then what you actually do, you reassemble all these updates in order to um, get the xt plus one. So what I want to highlight here this is not stochastic version of the function, like it's not the gradient of f of i with like a sparse version of the input. Because you actually kill neurons here and there, you actually change your function every time, okay? So this is not pure stochastic gradient descent. This is not pure stochastic coordinate descent, neither quantized stochastic coordinate descent. So we try to get as close as possible to this because the question here is how close a subnetwork as a function is to the original function because you have killed some neurons. And if there is a bound on that, then you can actually have a bound on the convergence of this algorithm, but this is what we have been working on lately. So the best that I can actually do, okay, let's simplify this because this is like the distributed setting. Maybe you have only one worker. 
and you actually say that every iteration I'm going to subsample the, the parameters and I'm going to do gradient descent on that. But again, it's not like coordinate descent kind of thing because you kill the neurons in the forward and the backward part. So it's not like coordinate descent that you are going to see all the information and then subsample from the gradient. Um, so um, in order to solve this kind of problem, so we have kind of an, uh, some approximations. The, the, the first step that we have to do is to consider just assume that you don't do exactly what we do, but we actually you actually work on with compressed iterates. This is uh, related to a recent work by Peter Richtarik, actually, uh, which is actually called gradient descent with compressed iterates, where you actually um, uh, you see the full model, but you apply and you work only on a compressed version of the uh, of your model. Okay. Sure, you can have in a non-convex scenario, you can have a type of like uh, uh, proof that actually says uh, stationarity, like you get to a stationary point. There is a convergence region that we don't like. There is a big old like constant plus that we cannot kill. But this is what you have to pay by the time you compress. And by compress here, I mean that per iteration, I only update a small number of my, let's say, um, of my model, a small number of uh, elements from my model. Okay, so you can have the one over t kind of like convergence rate in expectation for um, this kind of scenarios, but you have to pay some a lot of constants that I'm not going to get into there. But this is standard, let's say, smoothness, Lipschitz continuity, variance, stochastic variance bounds um, uh, that we don't know how to kill them yet. But uh, this is the best we can do for now. Okay. That was not very satisfying because if you see that, you actually what you're actually saying is that I'm going to have a compressed input to my model, but I will let it compute the forward and the backward pass on the full model. So it will give you a dense, let's say, output from your gradient. And what we said as a second step would be what if we actually insert as an input um, a compressed model, but also we compute and we compress the output. And again, that's that's what I'm saying. It's not very interesting. You can get this like a, a proof like this, but still, this is not exactly what we do. It's not that we have the full access to the full model. It's like we first change the model and then we apply the compressed iterates. And this is what we're missing right now. This is what we try to do ongoing work, because if you assume the function if it's generic, non-convex, maybe it does not give you the, let's say, the possibility to really play with the ingredients on your function. Why not using a one hidden layer or two hidden layer neural network and really know exactly the structure of your problem? In that case, we try to see whether the way that we operate, maybe we can do something more or, or give a better, let's say, um, uh, let's say, uh, bounce. But again, this part is not something like to flash you like, yeah, we can do theory, but we're not very happy about the results we have so far. And this is what we try to do. And of course, this is just training here, right? This has nothing to do with generalization, how dropout gets into like the scenario, how many splits you're going to have, how this affects this, this and that. Like there are many questions that we can actually ask here. Okay, so just to be a little bit because I'm going to run out of time, does it work only on fully connected layers? Um, first attempt was like, we can try, and this is what I showed you, is like, um, you can assume that the convolutional layers are going to be shared or they're going to be centrally, let's say, updated, because you know that the fully connect, like the convolutional layers are, do not take much of the percentage of the full model. Usually the fully connected layers take most of the, um, let's say, of the, of the memory, okay? And this is what I have shown you so far, to be honest. Uh, what about other architectures? So we said that we're not very happy. We're going to push it a little bit to see what we can actually do. The first attempt that we tried is actually with residual networks. Okay. We said that, you know what, let's not focus on that fine grained, let's say, analysis of neuro of, of, let's say, layers. We're going to consider blocks, residual blocks. Okay. So at the top, let's say, line, you have, let's say, five residual blocks, you have skip connections. The IST version of that is actually, I'm going to take these residual blocks and I'm going to split them into subnetworks to create more shallow resnets, okay? Before, and I will train them locally before I combine them together into the bigger resnet, okay? 
Now, what is the main difference with what, what we said so far is that, first of all, here we also allow overlaps. It's not that we allow completely, let's say, independence between two subnetworks. Okay. The other question that we might have is like how the subnetwork, the client, knows that what they actually train is actually part of a bigger ResNet. And this is where the ODE's like um, theory comes into play, where you can actually see uh, um, the ResNet as a discretization of an ODE and how you actually use the step size kind of actually reflects also the, the depth of your, of, of your ResNet. So you have to be careful how you actually set the step size in this scenario. And someone would say, okay, this kind of like seems easy to do. What I'm showing here is that the naive decomposition will not give you the final result that you want. For example, if you just split, as I said, and then you reassemble, you get, a, a, let's say, an accuracy of 66%, even if you know that the state of the art is in the ballpark of 90%. So I'm just, what I'm trying to say here, it's made, I'm hiding a lot of, let's say, details that we have, like as our, 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 our uh, let's say, technique. You need to be careful what you're going to um, partition, uh, what kind of like activation you're going to use, what kind of ResNet you're going to use, what is the minimum depth. This is kind of relates to how many GPUs I'm going to use. You cannot just make a very, let's say, shallow ResNet because that does not make sense. That's why we started with the ResNet 101. And this is kind of like the result that very quickly I want to show here is that what you see with the gray, let's say, curve is that the local SED fully optimized with ablation study about what should be the right number of local SEDs, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually get the same accuracy with a lot of speed up. So, so I'm going to show that, that that speed up that we get up to four machines, we can get four times speed up. When you get to eight machines, you still live in the four times speed up because then you have to think about, is my model big enough? Is my data set big enough? So maybe you have to consider other models in order to do that. So this kind of like the speed up that we get for four models, I think, for, um, yeah, that's the table three, as I say, it's actually using four workers. The table four is actually using eight workers. And you can see that we slightly get a better speed up but it's not like we get closer to the eight worker case. And we just think like, because these are small scale experiments, maybe we have to scale up and go to, to bigger models. Um, again, the same thing, it, it also applies to even deeper ResNets up to ResNet 200. We see some speed up, so this is kind of like scales up. What is missing here, and I know that I have only one minute, uh, what is missing here is like ImageNet. This is what we have been trying to do now uh, the reason we don't have ImageNet is that, to be honest, we didn't have the money to do it. Now we have access to a cluster in order to do it. Like it's like um, I borrowed GPUs from a, from a colleague of mine who has an eight GPU cluster and we'll see what we can actually do there. Because people are not very happy by the time they don't see ImageNet, they say, okay, you failed, like go back and get me ImageNet, otherwise you're not going to be accepted. Uh, so anyway, so this is what we have so far with CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 for ResNets. Um, very quickly, we applied this also with graph convolution neural networks, same ideas, but again, you have to be careful how you split things. What I would like to highlight here is that we managed to train the very latest Amazon 2 million data sets um, on graph neural networks, even having, a, let's say, a width of a neural network up to 32,000 nodes, like neurons. So these are really big let's say networks that we managed to actually train and you cannot even imagine how to do it unless you have like an army of PhD students doing the same thing. So, so um, this is what we can get. We get faster performance, we get faster to the same accuracy or better accuracy by using our method. I don't have the time to go over that. I just want to conclude with questions actually. And I'm just the question that I have here is that everything is open here. We don't understand fully how the optimization works. We don't understand fully how the generalization works because we get some boost from that. Not always. As I said, we have a gap in the ImageNet currently and we try to figure out why. Uh, we want to go beyond that. For example, I would like to really have a only like convolutional neural network or mobile devices. That would be very good because no mobile device will do ResNet 101. Okay. I know there are cases where 
uh, you actually have pre-trained models. We also try to do that right now in order to do federated learning, where you have multiple models already trained, and then you have some fully connected layers at the very end, where in that case, you actually apply IST. Um, we want to do the, the case of transformers to see whether we can do something there. Federated learning, one of the main things that we try to do, uh, we saw that somehow it helps on non-ID data. While we have the federated averaging and fed prox, somehow this decomposition that you don't need any regularizer by itself, it regularizes well, it actually gives you a 2% boost, but at the same time, we're not very um, sure about what is the state of the art setup. Like people use federated learning, but they, the setup that, that they have been considered so far, it might not be very close to reality. And we try to see what we can actually do in this case. Um, quantization, some results already. You can, on top of what I said, you can actually quantize. And unless you go down to four bits, and this is not training, this is just communication, by the way, uh, you actually preserve, let's say, a good accuracy. And of course, the implementation with smartphones, is this is something that we would like to, because this is a joint work with Intel, and they really care about the federated learning and how we can actually have wireless channels in this. Um, that would be something really interesting. The last thing I want to say is that there is connection with, uh, that we actually study right now with, and I forgot to say, with the lottery ticket hypothesis, that actually our method can be used as a pre-trained, as a, as a, yeah, I know, Yanis, I'm, I'm finishing now. Uh, so um, the lottery ticket hypothesis has the, the two parts. Actually, there are many works. The original one says that you have to train it first and then go back. Um, there, there are some early bird tickets that they actually say you don't have to fully train it, but you need an initial phase, okay? And we are, what we actually try to do is the following. This initial phase can be a bottleneck. And what we try to understand here is whether in this initial phase we can actually train even bigger than a single GPU can run bigger models so that if I can train in the pre-training phase a bigger model with IST, maybe I can find easier and better lottery tickets. So there are questions that we can try there and this is what we have been trying to do lately. I stop here. Thank you very much, guys. These are actually, two of them are on archive. The other one is going to be on archive soon. Um, I hope that this is not a problem with the new ICML, let's say, uh, kind of like a rule that you don't have to, you, you shouldn't advertise that much your work. Uh, but yeah, that's the, thank you very much for your attention, guys. Thank you, Tasso. Thank you for the great talk.